fallen to the ground. Father, we praise you this morning. We adore you. We ascribe to you strength and honor and glory and power and riches and wisdom. Father, we praise you that you have established your king on Mount Zion. And that as the nations scoff and as they rage against him, as they claim to have the power to tear off whatever binds them to you, you laugh from heaven. Because you do your will, Father, in the heavens, at the earth, and under the earth. And no man can say to you, what are you doing? All the nations, Father, are like a drop in a bucket and less than nothing. Lord, kings will be born today and kings will die. But your administration never changes. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, in the midst of these times, Corruption, greed, stupidity, arrogance, men being vile, hating and hating one another. It is a testimony to the truth of your word that men are depraved and need a savior. That the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. That although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, nor give thanks. They became foolish, futile in their speculations. Father, though all men be liars, You are true. And Your Word is true. Father, we never want to take for granted who you are. If you were not pure, if you were not holy, if you were not just, the idea of God would be a terrifying reality. But you are pure and holy and just, <clears throat> compassionate full of loving kindness showing your mercy to a thousand generations of those who love you Father this day we're gathered here to know your son to consider him To behold Him, Father, as one would behold a multifaceted diamond. Turning it in the light, Father. I pray that we would see Him. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're sitting here today and we are going to consider some things about the sun. We're on page 48. We're talking about the reasons for which Christ came. He came for the love of His people. He came for the glory of God. He came for the great joy that was set before Him. And part of that great joy set before Him was His exaltation. He looked forward to returning to the Father. He looked forward to receiving not only a glory that He had with the Father before the foundation of the world, but even a greater glory. He looked forward of reigning in the light of having redeemed a people for Himself. It's absolutely amazing. 
that through Him, through His submission to the Father, His incarnation, His kinesis, His self-emptying, His becoming a man, He gained for Himself a people. He did it as God. He did it as man. And now He is returning to the Father. Something that we spoke on last week that is so very, very important. There is a sense in which Christ returns to the glory He had before the foundation of the world with the Father. There is another sense in which He returns to a far greater glory. Not just the magnitude of glory because of what He has done, but the fact that now He takes that glory upon Himself in the body of a man. A glorified man. So when we talk about Philippians chapter 2 and Christ laying aside His glory, becoming man, you have to realize that it is the only time in history where the subtraction is actually an addition. He lays aside His glory. He did not become something less than God. He became something more than God. He became something God had never been. And that is also man. And he had to become man to work redemption and to save a people. And now He's going back to the Father. Let's go to John 17:24. Father, I desire that they also, whom You have given Me, be with Me where I am, so that they may see My glory, which You have given Me. For You loved Me before the foundation of the world. Now, the word desire comes from the Greek word telo, which may be translated to will. And so it's not just I desire, but, but I will. Many uh, old scholars uh, refer to this as the last will and testament of Christ for His people. It's not only His desire, it is His strong will. He is determined for what to happen. We look at it, that we be with Him and that we see His glory. That we be with Him and see His glory. Seeing the glory of another is even common in, in fallen man by the common grace of God. What do I mean by that? If a father sees his son doing either a moral deed or performing some great athletic feat or some heroic uh, thing, he glories in what his son has done. A son should, in a sense, glory in his father. Little boys think their dad, rightly, think their dad is Superman. They glory in their father. So even in our fallen world, we can, we can see men getting joy from glorying in the glory of another. Well, in heaven, that will be our joy. It will be our joy, His exaltation. It will be our joy to see all great things ascribed to Him. Now, um, John Trapp writes, Every word is full of life. I would not say, if Mr. Baxter, for all the world, that one verse had been left out of the Bible. Now see, you can read this text, look at it, and be nonchalant and not realize that it's one of the greatest texts in the entire Bible with regard to the future grace given the believer. You just read over it so quick to get to something else. What you need to realize, you never read quickly in the Bible to get to the good stuff because it's all the good stuff. Father, I desire that they also, whom You have given Me, be with Me where I am. I can tell no one in this room understands this text. Either you're all sleeping. Because if you understood this text, you'd be breaking forth in tears, you'd be shouting for joy, you'd be jumping over tables, we'd have to restrain you. I mean, after all, if, a, if a, an official or assistant of Bill Gates walked in the door right now and said, uh, Bill Gates has decided to, de decided to give you a million dollars or two million dollars, you'd be ecstatic. You'd be calling everybody on the phone. 
mom, dad, friends, everybody. You couldn't even stay in the class. You'd leave the class over a measly million dollars. Some of you would do it over a candy bar if someone gave it to you. But look what's going on here. Father, I desire. Now look at that. You ever been in a place where you knew that the only reason you were there is because well, the people who let you be there felt it was their responsibility to let you be there, but no one really wanted you around? I feel that way a lot of times after I preach my first sermon in a meeting. Well, he's here. We don't want to cause a scandal and put an end to the meetings. Let's just bear with him for a while. Can't last that long. But look what he says, Father, I desire something I will, I want. I want Paul Washer with me where I am and I want him to see my glory. If you want to answer a prayer for me, then answer this prayer, Father. That's how much I want this to happen. That's amazing. There's enough fuel in that to propel you through an entire Christian life. Just that right there. That one thing. I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am. The problem is, many times, because of bad evangelism, people are more drawn to the Christian life because of the promise of pearly gates and streets of gold and a utopia where they won't hurt any longer. Instead of realizing that heaven is heaven because of Christ. Because of Christ. The question is never, do you want heaven? The question is, do you want Christ? The devil wants heaven. He'd take it back in a second. But not at the expense of honoring Christ. Do you want Christ? Now, we talk about repenting. And that's good. Repenting from commandments broken. That's good. It's not only good, it's necessary. But we ought to be repenting for lack of love. Repenting for a lack of passion. Repenting for a lack of desire. I mean, it seems to me that if you were to talk about desires, the lesser should have greater desire than the greater. And what I mean by that is, it seems to me that if you have two people in a relationship, one being of, of almost infinite greatness, or in this case, of infinite greatness, and the other having no greatness at all, it seems to me that the one who had no greatness at all would have the stronger desire for the one that was infinitely great. But here it's reversed. The one who is infinitely great has the greatest passion for the one who's worthless. And the one who's worthless can't recognize the infinite greatness of the one who wants him. It's like, and I may have shared this last week, someone asked, you know, I actually came into contact with some people the other day who believed that they had not sinned for many years. Now, Christians believing in Christ, or professing Christ, let me put it that way, but not believing they had sinned. They took one text where Jesus told the person, go and sin no more, as a proof text that a believer could live without sin. And I said, well, all right, you haven't broken, you haven't committed adultery. You haven't built an idol in your house out of wood. But let me ask you this question. Have you loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? No, you have not. You have never done that. Have you done everything that you've done for the glory of God? Have you ever done that one time? No. You have never loved God as He ought to be loved and you have never glorified God as He ought to be glorified. Never. That changes things, doesn't it? Well, now, I like what John Trapp says here, quoting Mr. Baxter, that I would not for all the world that one verse had been left out of the Bible. And you say, well, I had never even really... I've read that verse a lot of times, but I never really saw its importance. 
Now that oughtn't depress you. That ought to make you very excited. Why? You've got a book in front of you you're never going to exhaust. It's always going to surprise you. And you don't understand it. And neither do I. Not that there are layer after layer of hidden meanings like it was some dark, esoteric, mysterious book. No. But simply that it is, it is the voice of God. It is the revelation of God. And in that, there is such depth, width, width length, that you'll never be able to sound it out. The Father loves the Son and will not answer Him reluctantly or meagerly, but bountifully. Christ did not have unanswered prayers. You say, well, what about the garden? Well, listen carefully to what He's saying. If it's your will, let this cup pass from me. That wasn't, let, you, let this cup pass from me. At all costs, only if it's your will. Christ's praying, particularly in John 17, was answered, will be answered, not meagerly, but bountifully. That means what He's asking here, Father, I desire that they also whom You have given Me be with Me where I am. It doesn't mean a little cabin over on the hillside of heaven. That doesn't mean being six trillion miles away from Christ. That doesn't mean getting the cheap upper seats in the stadium. doesn't mean that uh, because of your uh, because you were not one of the great ones of Christianity that you're only going to bump into Christ maybe once in an eternity. He's going to bountifully answer this prayer regarding you. Front row seat for every believer. Intimate relationship for every believer. Spurgeon does not have a greater portion in Christ than you do. And that's exciting. It's very exciting. Now, he says, Whom you have given me. Here we find a great motive for God's saving work among sinful men. He is moved to save them, not because of some merit found in them, but to give them to His Son. We hear about Jesus Christ being the Father's gift to us. That's true. Don't let anybody take that away. Some theologians are not theologians, but young men doing theology seems to them a statement like that seems trite. That Jesus is God's gift to us. But it's true. It's true in every sense of the phrase. But more than that, the overriding principle, the thing most important here is not that Jesus is God's gift to His people, but that the people are God's gift to His Son. He did not save you primarily because of you. You need to understand that. Because if He had to do it based on you, He would have never done it because there was no worth and no merit in you. The only thing a sinful man can motivate a holy, just God to do is to condemn Him. But He saved you for His glory. He saved you because He is love, as it says in Deuteronomy when He answers Israel, I loved you because I loved you. It means it had nothing to do with you. So He saved you for His glory. He saved you because of His love. He saved you for His Son. Now, get with the program. What do I mean by that? He saved you so that throughout all of eternity, you would be a blessing to His Son. So start now. Eternal life does not start when you cross over into glory. It starts at the moment of your conversion. Eternal life is this, to know Him. So, start knowing Him now. The purpose of your salvation is to bless Him. Start blessing Him now. Now, throughout the ages, God has saved and transformed a countless multitude from Adam's fallen race 
so that He might give them as a gift to Christ. Now, this is not in itself, apart from the working of God, this is not a very good gift. To, to be honest with you. I mean, if you want to give me a gift, do not give me people. I, I'd, I'd really, I, I'd, I'd rather have a horse. <laughs> It's like I was sitting up in the Andes Mountains one day on this kind of this knoll with an old friend of mine, Pedro Garcia. He used to be one of the most powerful witch doctors in the north of Peru. And he was amazingly converted. We're sitting there and he's got his poncho on and his big old hat. And we're just kind of got the knees drawn up sitting there on the grass. And he goes in Spanish. He says, Brother Paul. I said, Yes, Brother Peter. He said, I've... Uh, I've pastored a lot of cattle. That's the same word in Spanish. And I said, yes, I know. He said, I've pastored a lot of people. I said, I know that too. And he kind of looked at me. He's a very serious man with a twinkle in his eye. Twinkle in his eye and he said, cattle are a lot easier. <laughs> I said, yes, brother. So don't think, oh my goodness, Christ is getting this wonderful gift to here I am. Like my wife sometimes when I forget her birthday present. Where's my birthday present? Honey, I'm your present. No, really, where's my present? <laughs> I mean, to give a bunch of lying, hating, wicked, depraved, ugly, human beings to your son? So what is the gift here? See, I want you to realize that, that it's not some worth inside of humanity. We've put an end to our worth. Not some beauty. We killed our beauty. It's not some gift. We stomped all those into the filth of our own lives. The beauty is the grace of the work that God is going to do to transform those people. And what He's giving them is a work of God. You see the difference? Not this soupy idea that, that uh, Jesus can't live without me. Not this soupy idea that man has this some incredible infinite worth that could even delight His Creator. But the joy of this is the work of God in it. To take something. As a matter of fact, it may be argued that He took the worst thing He could take and made it the, great, the greatest gift He could give. And He did that in order to demonstrate His power. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 Not many of you are noble. Not many of you are wise. So the greatness of the gift is demonstrated by beginning with basically one of the most, if not the most worthless gift you could possibly give and turning it into something absolutely precious. We are recipients. If you want a title, then let me give you a good one to hold on to all your life. Recipient of the grace of God. Do you want to be something else? Recipient of the grace of God. That's why I love the Apostle John so much. He doesn't refer to himself as the one who loved Jesus, but the one whom Jesus loved. He doesn't even boast in His love, which would be a really good thing for some of you to learn. I find it very difficult, although it is not unbiblical to sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. I find it very difficult for me to boast in, Oh, how I love Jesus. I find very little to sing about in my love for Him. But I find a whole lot to sing about in, Oh, how Jesus loves me. Okay, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. Now, 
Christ now reveals the great motive behind His petition. He asked that His people might see His eternal splendor, the fullness of His excellencies, perfections, beauty, and power. The Son desires to be glorified because He is God and it is right for Him to do so. You know, entertainment, and I may get myself in trouble here, entertainment, just at face value, an entertainer, Now, I'm, I'm, maybe there's a motive out there that I'm unaware of, but it seems to me the motive is I, I want everyone to see me. I want everyone to see how funny I am. Or I want everyone to see how beautifully I sing. Now, I know that there are boasts made in an opposite direction that says I'm doing this all for them. But I find that very hard to believe. As a matter of fact, in some schools of music, the first time a child picks up a violin and starts playing, the parents are encouraged, uh, even at the first practice session, to applaud the child. Just applaud them and applaud them. But what that seems to me to be doing is to cause the child to fall in love with the violin because of the applause they receive. Because they are made the center. So in most cases, when someone wants to take center stage, it is not for altruistic reasons. It is not for selfless reasons. But here we hear Christ saying, Be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. Now, although we're... Although we talk with more certainty than we ought to regarding the fall of Satan, it does seem possibly that he sought to exalt himself. So what makes Christ any different? I mean, if we heard this kind of language coming out of a man or an angel, it would almost turn our stomach. Who do you think you are? I mean, if you were to say, I'm going to preach tonight, Brother Paul. I want you to be there so that you can see my glory. It's like the young man who the pastor gave him an opportunity to preach and as he was walking up to the pulpit, his head was held high and his chest was out and boy, he was so excited about what he had to say. And after about 15 minutes of absolute nothing, babbling and everything else, falling apart up there behind the pulpit, he walked down with his shoulders hung over and his head dragging on the ground and the preacher looked at him later and said, Son, if you'd have walked up there the way you came down, you would have came down the way you walked up. We know that someone's seeking glory for himself. It's a grotesque thing. And this in itself is a proof of the deity of Jesus Christ. Who but God can use this kind of language? And for our Jehovah Witness friends, they need to realize that not even angels can use this kind of language. It's just not right. No angel can say, I want them to see my glory. Why? Because it's clearly set out God does not share His glory. You see, these statements that you think are just common, ordinary statements are filled with meaning. Only God can say these things. Only God can do these things. So, first of all, I want you to recognize that He is God and it is right for Him to seek His glory. Now, another thing, to shun this glory would be to deny His deity. God takes first place unapologetically. Why? Because He's God. Do you want Him to give it to you? I've said this a million times based on Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, and it's so true. But not just Edwards, everyone realizes this. A rational being must have an end for all that he does. If I catch you out doing something, what, what, why are you doing this? I don't know. 
That's irrational. All beings, even the creature, has a reasonable end for his works, for what he is doing. So we must ask ourselves, what is the reasonable end for creation, for the existence of life? What is the reasonable end? Now we can narrow this down to two choices. Well, three. If God is not a reasonable being, then it could be for no reason at all. But we know that's not true. So we can narrow it down now to two. He does it either for His creation or He does it for Himself. Now who should be the end or the purpose or the reason behind the existence of everything? Should it be the creature or should it be the Creator? It should be the Creator. I always answer that when people say to me, they go, I have a real problem with God being the end of all things. I go, well, who would you like to take His place? You? You? And basically, I can tell you that in modern day contemporary Christianity, that's exactly what's happened. If I walk into a church and say, God's done everything He's ever done for you, not one person will have a problem with it. But if I get in there and say, God's done everything He's ever done for Himself, well, I just I don't believe that. Well, then for whom? Well, um, for me. You see how absurd that is? Even such songs as God loves people more than anything. That's not true. Now, the Son desires that His glory be seen by His people because the most loving and gracious thing He could do for them and the highest privilege He could confer upon them would be a to allow them entrance into His presence to behold the fullness of His glory. Now, we've gone through this again, but we'll do it again. Christ takes glory for Himself because He is God, and that's what He ought to do. But also, Christ glorifying Himself is the greatest thing He can do for you. The greatest gift that Christ can give you is to take center stage and do everything He does so that the beauty and the greatness and the perfection of all that He is is revealed to you. What greater gift could He give you? What, you want a, a world or something? You want a star? You want a puppy? I mean, what do you want in heaven? What are you getting out of heaven? What do you want there? Why do you even want to go? Think about it. Gates of pearls and streets of gold and, and all that. You only swing on a gate so long before you get bored. See, that is one of the greatest problems in Christianity. And you hear it in our music. Singing more about heaven than the Christ of heaven. Everyone wants to go to heaven. But does everyone who wants to go to heaven want God? That's why we have to turn our people. We have to turn the people we're preaching to. And tell them, what are you doing? Because I hear your language, I hear you talk, and it sounds to me you're more enamored with a utopian idea than you are with the presence of God. And when they say, no, I'm not, then just ask them this question. If eternal life begins with knowing God, and since you already have eternal life and the door's been open for you to know Him, how much time do you spend knowing Him? That right there will describe the faith of many or reveal it. That we want a utopia more than we want Him. I'll never forget, and I've shared this many times, Charles Leiter preaching over in, in Romania. He preached on heaven in the presence of God for an hour and a half. It was, I just sat there, I was almost doing flips. In the, I mean, I just, I was on the same panel, so I was sitting up front, so I couldn't do anything crazy, but I just wanted to, 
I don't know, run through the Transylvania forest screaming hallelujah. It was absolutely wonderful. He was talking about the glories of Christ. And after he poured out his heart in Scripture for about an hour and a half, he said, are there any questions? And a guy raised their, his hand and said, what else do we get when we get to heaven? I mean, I hear people, I can't wait to get to heaven. You think we'll be able to fly, Brother Paul? I don't think that's a biblical question. So the greatest thing He can do for us is show us Him. John Owen writes, It is evident that in this prayer the Lord Christ hath respect unto His own glory. We, we would be wise to have respect unto His glory. And the manifestation of it. Now what is He saying that He hath respect? That, that, that He just respects Himself? No, He's saying that he, He's concerned about it. It occupies Him. Now that's God language. God is concerned about His glory. You just need to glimpse at the Old Testament and you'll find out He's very concerned about His glory. As a matter of fact, you better not touch His glory because He doesn't share it with anyone. You touch His glory and you're in for, well, you're in for some, some bad things. I was listening to Conrad and Bewe preach a while back. One of the best sermons I've, I've ever heard in my life. And um, he pointed out something that in Romans 1 that's so very important. As a matter of fact, let's just turn there for a moment. I want to show you something. And this, in the, in the context of our own country, uh, it ought to somewhat terrify you. Verse 21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. Literally, they did not glorify Him or give thanks. Even though they knew God, they were not concerned for His glory. It didn't occupy their mind. They weren't set on glorifying God. They weren't desiring... Well, it's the very opposite of, of the model prayer in Matthew chapter uh, 6. Hallowed be Thy name, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. They, they weren't concerned about God's name being hallowed. Prior to our conversion, we weren't concerned about God's name being seen as unique in creation. Now, Here's the thing that I want you to see. If you go down in verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they're gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Now, a lot of people do not understand this text and, and their idea is you know, that God's judgment is going to come because of these things like wickedness and greed and evil and envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. Because of these things, God's judgment is going to come. No, that's not what this teaches. Please understand, you're wrong if you think that. What he's saying is this. These things like wickedness, greed, evil, gossip, slanders, haters of God, this is the result of the judgment of God. The judgment of God has already fallen. And why is it fallen? Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him. So see, the great crime in this passage is not homosexuality. The great crime in this passage is although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, and therefore God turned them over in judgment because of that one thing. You see that? What's the greatest sin? You want to know what it is? 
It's something that you do not outwardly intentionally do now, but you do. Although you know God, you do not honor Him as He ought to be honored. So now don't talk to me about sinless perfection. Don't talk to me about how righteous you are in your daily walk. Because we want to take this thing to a whole new level. You can be an external rule-keeping Pharisee all day long if you want. And take pride in how great you are. But you have never glorified God as He ought to be glorified. And you've never loved Him as He ought to be loved. So let's just put ourselves all back into Isaiah um, of having a broken and a contrite heart and spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Very powerful, isn't it? Very powerful. Our country is the way it is. It's not that our country is, man, we're wickedness, greed, envy, full of envy, murder, and strife, and deceit, and because of all these things, we're going to be judged. No, because all these things exist, it shows we're already judged. And why were we judged? Because although we knew God, we did not glorify Him as God or give thanks. The average person in the pew, though, their idea of sin is just in the realm of breaking rules. Do you see that? And that's why most people think, well, I'm, I'm pretty much okay. I mean, I haven't, you know, I don't cheat on my wife. I don't build idols. I mean, you'd be crazy to do that. And, and they don't see what the real issue is. And you've got to tell them. You've got to tell them what the real issue is. You haven't glorified God. You hear young people, you know, say, be living in all kinds of horrible sin. And they talk to him about God, oh, I love God. I mean, no. The fact that you're living the way you're living is, in a sense, the judgment of God upon you because you don't love Him. You see, let's go back. It says, the Lord Christ, Owen says, the Lord Christ hath respect unto His own glory and the manifestation of it. Now, if anyone other than God, if this was said about anyone other than God, we'd have some serious problems. Hey, Brother Paul, why are you so distraught today? Well, I'm really concerned for my own glory and I, I really want it to be manifested more to people. I just don't think... I'm getting the credit and respect I deserve out there. If people could only see my glory the way it really is, things would change. I mean, you would say, that guy needs some serious counseling. And, and that ought to show us something. I mean, I, I've already tore apart the entertainers. Let me tear apart the greatest idol in America, which is athletics. If I had a dime for every athlete I've seen come in front of a camera and go, well, I'm finally getting some of the respect I, feel, I think I deserve. <laughs> well, just look for a moment. What's going on? You deserve... You can't breathe apart from God. But that's another sermon. We don't want to run that rabbit. Okay. But in this place, he is not so much concerned for his own glory as he is for the advantage, benefit, satisfaction, and blessedness of his disciples in beholding it. You see, God is concerned for his own glory. And if, if we left it there, it would still be all right. Please understand it. I don't want you to think that I say this. God is concerned for His own glory and that's the best thing He could possibly do for us. I don't want you to think that I'm making that secondary statement so that I'll, you, know, you won't be mad at God for doing something that isn't right. I want you to know if it wasn't the best thing for us, 
Him being concerned for His own glory is right. Okay? It's right. But it happens to be, as Owen says, the best for us. He says, um, So Joseph charged his brethren when he had revealed himself unto them that they should tell his father of all his glory in Egypt. This he did, not for the ostentation of his own glory, but for the satisfaction which he knew his father would take in the knowledge of it. And such a manifestation of his glory unto his disciples does the Lord Christ here desire, as might fill them with blessed satisfaction forevermore. Find out your brother has been taken over into a foreign land. A foreign land that seems very strange and even dangerous to you. And you know that you have to go there. Someone tells you that your brother has obtained some rank. And so you begin to ask yourself, Well, I'm going. I sure hope my brother has enough rank or a place for me to stay or some influence to maybe help me once I get there because I don't even have a clue what I'm supposed to do when I get there. And then as you're, as you're making your way there and down the journey and you meet other people coming from that city and you, you ask them, do you know my brother? Well, who is he? Well, his, his name is Jesus. Can you tell me about him? Jesus is your brother? Yes, he is. Well, you've got nothing to worry about then. I mean, there's no one that outranks him. There's no one over him. He is the King of kings and the Lord. of. If he's your brother, don't worry about crossing over to the other side. His glory is immense. So His glory is a comfort. We know that no one outranks this Savior of ours. No one's going to annul the work He's done. There's not going to be, as I, as I love to say, and I've written many times, there's never going to be a changing of the guard or another administration to replace the old one. Jesus is always the God with whom you must deal. Now, for the lost man who hates him, that's a terrifying reality. But for the believer, that's absolutely spectacular. He will not change, and no one will change him. So what does that mean? Peace. Peace. Just as a side note... Um, Some of you were saved very young, and that's a great blessing. As a matter of fact, to me, that's the greatest of all testimonies when someone's been saved from most of the garbage and sin that I've waded through in my life. But at the same time, it is so easy to forget the lack of peace that we had prior to our conversion. I can remember at the university, and it all—it seemed to happen, I would get into the shower in the morning, have to get up real early in the morning for class, and get in the shower. Such, I mean, the dorm is quiet, it's dark outside, such an emptiness, an empty feeling just consuming me. What am I doing? I mean, why am I studying here? What am I going to do when I get out? Why am I even alive? Just nothing. Sometimes it's good to think back on that. Because we forget. We, we forget what a blessing it is just to have some measure of peace compared to the way we were prior to our conversion. Sometimes we need to look back so we can appreciate what's been given to us. I get up in the morning and I may have some fear, I may have some doubt, I may have a lot of things, but there's that at least 
that it's like a kernel it's like a kernel of, of wheat or something it may not be very large but at the same time it's foundational and gigantic no matter how small it gets it still seems to be foundational in my life and it's a controlling piece of Jesus Christ and even when I don't have peace, at least I know something. My life has purpose. It's headed in a direction. And all of this is not vain. Well, let's go on. Now he says this. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Well, I guess God didn't make you because He was lonely. God didn't make you because He had a need. He had no need. He was not lonely. As I always say, He did not make us out of His need, but out of the overflow of His superabundance. Because look at the relationship. You loved me before the foundation of the world. It's like the old timers used to say, you know, to their, their, their sons when they would get kind of rebellious and and maybe back talk to their mother. Listen, boy, I loved that woman before you were even a gleam in my eye. I loved that woman before you even existed. Now, the closest I'll ever come to murdering somebody is the day you touch your mother. I loved her before you even came into this world. God the Father loved His Son before the world ever came to be. And that is the relationship that is foundational in our salvation. One could say that our entire salvation is founded upon not the love of God for us, even though God does love men. But a deeper foundation is the love of God for His Son. He made this world out of love for His Son. Remember, for Him are all things. He saved the people because He loved His Son. Do you see? Now, some of you sitting here, I want you to realize something. Now compare what I'm saying and ask yourself, in the churches you've come from, in the churches you've been in and everything, have you ever even heard anybody talk this way? No! This type of language has nothing to do with modern day Christianity. And yet it is foundational. It's full of glory and joy unspeakable. Some of you are going to be missionaries. You want to know what keep you on the mission field? This. This is what will keep you on the mission field. You know what will keep you going when all storms of hell are breaking against you? This is what will do it. The Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world. He desires a people for His Son. I'm digging in my heels and I'm staying here. Because this calling and ministry of mine is a part of bringing that to an end. I'm doing this to see the Son's joy. I'm doing this to see the Father's joy in beholding His Son. That's the strong medicine you need to be in the ministry. See, the Father seeks the Son's glory because of His eternal and paternal love for Him. And to think that He loves us as He loves His Son. And that for the believer it can also be said that the Father's love is paternal, fatherly, but it's also eternal. 
that He loved us before the foundation of the world. He not only loved you before you loved Him. He not only loved you before you knew Him. He loved you before you were or was. It's amazing. And so even in all those years of rebellion, the love of the Father was working to bring you to Him. And if He loved you when you were enemies, how much more does He love you now? John Gill calls it an ancient love. But sometimes that word ancient is the strongest of all words. We refer to a man as ancient. It does have some quality to it, some ring to it. But it also means feeble, weak, on their way out. But when God is called the Ancient of Days, it has nothing to do with feeble or weak or old or decrepit. It speaks of His wisdom and His eternity and His power. And that love is ancient. We say that when love, that love grows old, you know, no one ever says that positively. Do you realize that? Man, my love for her has grown old. That doesn't mean anything good. You walk up to your wife and say, Honey, my love for you has grown old. She is not going to be happy with you. But here, that it's an ancient love. See, over time, God does not wane. You and I wane. Our love wanes. So the first time going over the Andes Mountains, I couldn't figure out why the missionary I was with, old Homer Crane, sat there and just snored. I'm looking at all this beauty and I can't believe that he can't see it. He's snoring. But we've been over those Andes Mountains, that same road, countless times. Same way with me. Several years later, I'm taking a group of people across the Andes Mountains and I don't think I snored at least not as loud as him, but I really didn't care about the mountains. My passion for them had waned. A looking at them long enough caused them to become common to me. But when it says that God's love is ancient, if anything, it, it is consistent, okay? It doesn't get stronger, it doesn't get weaker, it's perfect. But if you had to go on one side or the other, it would be better to say it goes from strength to strength instead of from weakness to weakness. Now, the Father created the universe and ordained the salvation of a multitude from the mass of fallen humanity because He loves His Son and seeks His glory. We've already said that. Through His incarnation, perfect life, cross and resurrection, the door has been opened for the Son to gain the greatest glory for Himself. He has come to have first place in everything. First place as God. First place as man. First place in everything. First place among the resurrected. First place among the glorified. First place among the exalted. Firstborn. He's everything. Absolutely everything. First place in everything and all things in heaven and earth have been summed up in Him. All of this has been accomplished according to the good pleasure and perfect satisfaction of the Father. Ian and I were studying, we're studying the Beatitudes right now. My son Ian. And we got to inherit the earth. And uh, I said, son, do you know what inherit means? He goes, no. No, I don't. And I said, well, one day, as we've talked about before, I'm going to die. He said, yes. And I said, and when I do, 
everything that I own is going to go to you and your brother and your sister. You're going to inherit, inherit everything that I have. And of course, my son thinks that I own the world. Um, how sorely disappointed he is going to be when he gets older. But I said, everything that I own is yours. It's yours. Now, his little face lit up. I don't think he was excited about me passing on. But he just... It, it was like, you know, he's a little boy. He's just turned seven. And he, he you know, it's like, I would never thought of that before. It's like an epiphany. And then we went from inheriting the earth. And the joy that was, was in his face, and, and I took joy in it. Everything that belongs to the Father belongs to the Son. And the Father's done all this to give the Son first place. That's amazing. That's just amazing. Now I sit there and if we being evil can give good gifts to our children, that's what Jesus says. If we being, if, if you being evil, then, then, then what is this love of the Father that seeks for His Son first place in everything? I'm always telling my son, you know, that he'll say something and I'll say, oh, but son, I have plans for you. You're going to be a far greater man than your father. Now, if, if he becomes a greater man than his father, do you honestly think I'm going to mope? Do you think I'm going to say, oh, he beat me? If he's more godly, if he's more used of God, do you honestly think I'm going to sit there and just pout? I'm going to go wild. I want him to do that, to know that, to have that. I want that for him. Do you see that? Now, if I, being evil, can want that, what about the Father? See, most people would go from here and jump to you which is a rather sick thing in my mind. If God could so... You know, if we can want to give good gifts to our, um, to our children, then how much does God want to give good gifts to you? Now, that's true. Jesus said that. But I want you to step back first and think of this. If we can desire to give good things to our children, how much more does the Father desire and delight in giving good things to His Son? Think about Him before you think about you for a minute. I know it's hard. What kind of explosion of joy was there at the return of the Son into heaven, having accomplished? Can you, you know, you can't imagine. Don't even think, don't even try to think you can imagine. Me and my little boys, and, and probably someone who sees this on film will get mad at me, but me and my little boys are uh, Lord of the Rings fans. We just love watching those things. I don't know if it's just we love fighting or what it is, or you know, take out aggression some way. We just really get a kick out of them. And uh, the return of the king. What joy was there? Man, I hope it's all on film because I want to see it. The day He walked back and took His place at the right hand of the Father and the Father turning over all things to Him. Like in Daniel, that Son of Man comes up to the Ancient of Days and all power and honor and glory is given to Him. God has set His King on His holy hill. That's why I want you to know, listen, America may just be as close to death as ever. Maybe she's already died. There are some good officials and politicians, I'm sure, but by and large, it's nothing more than a bunch of 
corrupt little children. <clears throat> Stupid, vain men. But don't you worry about that. Because God has set His King on His holy hill. And He scoffs at the vanity of men. And all this has a purpose. Even this corruption, even this just absolute, almost insanity and vanity, it has a purpose. If, if nothing else, it does one thing. It proves that God is true and all men are liars. It proves everything God says about man is true. But don't worry. God is delighted in setting for Himself a king, a son of David, on the throne, just as He promised. And it's not He will reign. He is reigning. He is reigning. Now, let's take a break here for a few minutes and we'll go to Psalms 2.8 and find out some more wonderful things about this son. Take about five or ten minutes. All right, well, let's get started. We're on page 49. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank You for this morning and the strength You give us. You are a constant help, a constant source of, uh, of hope. Father, I pray that You get glory for Yourself and for Your Son out of the things that are said here this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, we've talked about the Son of God coming for the glory of God talked about Him coming for the, uh, for the joy that was set before Him. And now we're going to talk about Him coming and offering His life as a sacrifice for the joy of gaining a redeemed people. I want to read from the paragraph that I wrote here in the introduction. Thus far we've learned that God the Father loves His Son above all and has ordained all things for His glory and good pleasure. Thus, before the foundation of the world, God ordained to save a people out of the multitude of sinful humanity that they might be for the glory, honor, and praise of His Son. In accordance with the will of the Father, and in view of this joy set before Him, the joy of redeeming a people of His very own, the Son willingly, even joyfully, endured all for His bride and for the joy that she would ultimately bring Him. Through His incarnation and death, He has secured a great congregation for Himself from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. He has made them to be a source of continuous joy, satisfaction, and glory throughout all of eternity. Now, I want us just to think about a few things. Christianity, to say the least, is marginalized in our country. Um, usually when the media has anything to do with Christianity, it, it sets forth a Christianity that we would not even identify with and lampoons it, um, puts before the American people a, um, a false view of what Christianity really is. And there are a lot of characters out there, sp specifically among the TV evangelists, that present a wrong view of Christianity. So Christianity is marginalized and people think, even believers, that it is a small little thing going on in the earth. That is not true. If you add up the redeemed from every tribe, every nation, every people walking on this earth right now, you'll see that Christianity is the biggest thing going. It's the biggest thing going. God has not done this in a corner. He's not done it in a box. It's not some little thing He's going to give to His Son. It is a massive, redemptive work. And one day, when it is revealed at His coming, people 
will literally, the unbelieving and believing alike will be amazed at the magnitude of the work. Don't you ever think that Christianity is comprised of some little sectarian group somewhere in Alabama. It is huge. It is huge. Also, I, I want us to look at that He endured all for His bride and for the joy that she would ultimately bring Him. He is so patient in His working. And that is seen in our sanctification. Not being instantaneous. But that He is working and working patiently throughout the years of your life. Patiently from generation to generation to eventually make His bride a spectacle of joy unto Him. I think for those of us who are husbands, this is an amazing rebuke. That Christ loves His bride in her unsanctified state. He loved her even in her unjustified state. He loved her before she was. He loved her when she was an enemy. He loves her now as an imperfect bride that He is sanctifying and changing. That ought to share, with, tell you something about the way you ought to love your wife. Extremely important. Also, for those of us who are husbands, if you feel like your wife does not love you as she ought to, it's your fault. Remember what the Bible says. We love Christ because He loved us first. So, it is the man's love towards his wife. Now, I want to, to make it clear we're talking about in, in a common marriage, in a marriage where you're just struggling with the common problems. We're not talking about believers being left by unbelievers and so on and so forth. There are impossible people. But in our common ongoing marriages that we have that are sound and strong but lacking, you should know this. The husband needs to take the upper hand. Our love ought to be the thing that produces love in our wives. Because Christ loved us. And because of that, we love Him now. Now, He has also made them to be a source of continuous joy, satisfaction, and glory throughout all of eternity. Now, this is not because of something inherent in them, as I've said. It's because they have become His work. His workmanship. You see. Now, Charles Spurgeon writes, To bring his chosen to eternal happiness was the high ambition which inspired him and made him wade through a sea of blood. Only Spurgeon made him wade through a sea of blood to get his redeemed. And it's his high ambition which inspired him. Now, do you honestly think one with such a high ambition who has already gone to such great cost is going to lose one of his? And what you need to understand is that when you see salvation as a reward for some work you've done, then it makes common sense. It is common sense to think that it can be lost. But if salvation is a work of God to demonstrate how powerful He is in saving wicked men, you understand He is not going to lose one that He has saved. Because it is His reputation and His name that is riding upon it. I read this one more time and made him wade through a sea of blood. I read it simply because it's worthy of being read. It was not tiny drops of blood, but a sea of blood through which he had to wade. And not just the anguish caused by the abuse of men, but more so the anguish caused by the condemnation, the judgment of his father against him. Matthew Henry writes, The salvation of souls is a great satisfaction to the Lord Jesus. He will reckon all His pains well bestowed and Himself abundantly recompensed if 
the many sons be by Him brought through grace to glory. Let Him have this, and He has enough. God will be glorified. Penitent believers will be justified, and then Christ will be satisfied. You've heard the story about the two Moravian young men. One there sold themselves into slavery so that they could go to an island where there were only slaves and witness to them. There was no turning back. It wasn't going to be furlough. There was no, I'll come back if I don't like it. They sold themselves to a slave owner so that they could go witness to the slaves that he owned for life. And as they were pulling away from the dock on that boat, and their parents and the church family and everything standing there looking at them. One of them screamed and said, Shall not the Lamb have the full reward of His suffering? Now that's missions. They counted their life as worthless so that the Lamb might have the full reward of his sufferings. Gentlemen, don't waste your life playing stupid little games. Just don't do it. Now these were two young men, barely out of their teens. I mean, join them. Join them. And I'll tell you this right now. Some of you need to get out of Facebook. You need to get off all, offline. You need to quit playing with people and talking and writing little things like you were a little girl. You need to become a man and you need to start doing things that men of God do. It's very important. Don't not to take your life and compare it to two young men who sell themselves into slavery and then cry out to their weeping family, shall not the Lamb have the full reward of His suffering? Stop all this nonsense. Be men. Act like men. Go out and die for something worth dying for. Go out there and live for something worth living for. It's very important. Give your life for something. Please. Don't waste it. There's a bride to get for Him. There are children of God who have not heard the gospel of their salvation. They're yet to be birthed. There are churches to build. I mean, quit all this other stuff. And if your friends are, are silly, goofy friends, leave them. Follow Christ. Become a man. Walk with men. If you know all the styles and fashions and cool things and what's going on on the internet and what's going on in fashion and this and that and everything else, stop it. Who cares? I mean, there is a job to do. Be a man. Let's go to Psalms 2.8. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. Wow! Just ask it. Father, I have a request. Just ask it. Just ask it. You know what that demonstrates? It demonstrates not only the Father's willingness to give His Son what He asks, but it demonstrates the integrity of the Son. He says, ask of me anything. Why? Because He knows the Son. The Son is holy. The Son is just. The Son is righteous. He's not going to ask anything that doesn't belong to Him. 
You know, you can't just walk up to people and say, just ask me whatever you want, because you won't get a just answer. But with Him, ask of me. I'll give it to you. It shows the absolute trust of the Father and the Son. It's not like the daughter of Herod asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Give, just ask me. Up to the half of my kingdom, what do you want? I want that head of John the Baptist. So you've got to be very careful what you tell people to ask you. But not with the Son because of His integrity. Now, this psalm is attributed to David in Acts 4.25 and is frequently quoted in the New Testament as having been fulfilled in Christ. It has long been considered a messianic psalm. So many things said about David that just can't end with David. They're too big for David. They're too big for a man. I think David knew this. Guys, everything. You, you hear this statement about we need to interpret every word in the context of its the phrase of the verse, every verse in the context of its paragraph, chapter, every chapter in the context of the book, every book in the context of the testament, every testament in the context of the Bible as a whole, and the Bible in the context of Christ. That last part cannot be overemphasized. It's all about Him. It says things to David, it goes farther than David. It's all about Him. Why do you think the story of Samson is in the Bible? Do you think it's just a story about Samson? Do you think it's just a moral story telling us about a guy who was called of God but then failed, but then God's mercy, and that's all it's about. The Bible, I don't think there's any place in the Bible where it's just a moral story. The Bible is not necessarily a, just a book of morals. It's a book about Him. It's a book about Christ. I, I, I've got to believe that that man picking up those gates of that city on his shoulders and running up that hill is just a precursor to something much greater. A greater than Samson who would not fail. Who would not be tempted. And who would destroy his enemies without suffering any collateral damage. There will be no wound on him when he comes back. Now, I'm not talking about the marks of the cross. I'm talking about when his enemies rally against him on that final day, he'll not suffer damage. He won't have to kill himself to take his enemies with him. So what I, oh, the point I want you to see is that it's all about Christ. It's all about Him. It all points to Him. Everything in the Bible points to Him. To Him. To Him. Look for Him. Now, be careful. The Puritans came up with a lot of ingenious uh, metaphors and things thinking they saw Christ in certain things and maybe they did. But just realize this. This whole book is about Him. About His coming. About His redemption. Now, ask of Me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. With regard to David, this promise refers to his possession of the promised land and the subjection of the nations. With regard to the Son of God, it refers to His rule over all creation. For Himself from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. God has moved to save the nations, not because of some merit or virtue that He found in them, but that He might give them as a redeemed people, as an inheritance to His Son. Ask of me. And He did. Father, give me the nations. Give them to me. Give them to me. What is so amazing to me, it just, it just boggles my mind, is not just the privilege of being saved, which is enough, but the privilege of being called to go after the nations. I mean, 
most people just die. I mean, do you see that? Most people just live and die. Most people just exist. And believers are so distracted by things that don't matter. A hill of beans. And yet, we've been called to go after the nations. There's so much glory in that. So much privilege on our part. Charles Spurgeon writes, At grace, great feasts, many a monarch has been known to say to his favorite, Ask what I shall give thee, and nothing shall be denied thee this day. Even thus doth the great Father say to his glorious Son, the Prince of Peace, Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen, thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth thy possession. He bids him open his mouth wide and request a boundless dominion. He will give him distant nations, yea, the whole round earth to be his kingdom. You see, the Great Commission, it's about the salvation of men. Don't ever lay that aside. Anyone tells you that it's not, they're liars. They don't understand Scripture. They're off balance. It's about the salvation of men. But it's so much bigger than the salvation of men. So much bigger. It's about Him. It's about His reign. It's about His glory. It's about His delight. When, when you're a missionary, yes, you're serving people. But more, you're serving Him. So that if no people even recognize anything or seem to be benefited from anything you do, it doth not matter. Why? You're serving Him. You're serving Him. But also you know this, that since God has decreed to give Him a people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people. You know your work's not in vain. If you work within the context of God's will, your work is not in vain. Even if you die without seeing one convert, you know that the fruit of it will be eternal. And it will lead to the redemption of men. I mean, it is a, it is a win-win situation here. And remember this, this story I always like to tell because... Well, it just so, in my mind, sets up the truth and the reality of giving our lives to eternal things. Fred Bear, who was an absolutely magnificent bow hunter, hunted for seven years before he took his first large game. Seven years. And then went on to be, man, the greatest bow hunter probably that's ever lived. William Carey was in... India seven years before he won his first soul to Christ and then went on to win thousands hundreds of thousands of men to Christ now who do you think is happier at this moment in eternity Fred Bear who literally struggled seven years to take his first big game animal this is an amazing feat with a bow or William Carey. God's eternal. The souls of men are eternal. The Word of God is eternal. For what are you going to give your life? Fishers of men. Not fishers of junk they can pull out of a river. Not fishers of fish, fishers of men. Sometimes, every once in a while, I talk about it, almost never get to do it anymore, but I've lost a lot of desire to do it. I go out hunting, tracking something. But to be honest with you, it, it just has lost its excitement for me. When I know that I could be in a boat going down the Marignon or the Santiago River tracking men. Going into a village where the gospel's never been preached. I mean, 
There's room for both, I guess, but one sure supersedes the other, doesn't it? One surpasses the other. To go after men. Well, John Gill writes, These are given him as an inheritance and possession, as his portion to be enjoyed by him, and who esteems them as such and reckons them a goodly heritage and a particular treasure, his jewels and the apple of his eye. Such things to be said about us. John Gill's not wrong and he's not exaggerating when he calls us a goodly heritage, a particular treasure, the very jewels of Christ, the apple of his eye. It's biblical terminology. How could it be that a worm like us, a worm like us, could be given such titles. Don't you see? It's all of grace. It is all of grace. It is all of grace. It is all of grace. You are privileged, 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 privileged. It is all of grace. Stretch forth your hand and claim to have some part in this and I'll smack your hand as hard as I possibly can. Because you are wrong. It is all of grace. I had a professor one time, he looked at all of us sitting there, all the budding preachers in class, and he goes, automatically, first day, automatically, I know, I can rest assured that there is something terribly wrong with every one of you. That there are character flaws, that there are, I mean, some of you are just you know, half inch this side of wacko. And he said, I'll tell you why. Because not many noble are called. But the vile and the base. I always say that, that being saved is the only thing I ever qualified for. Because the qualification is need. Is need. Now, Christ gave Himself to the cross with the sure hope that His labor would not be in vain and His reward would not be meager. Sovereign grace would see to it that the Son would receive His reward in full. God promised His servant Abraham, Now look unto the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. So shall your descendants be. If God made such a promise, a promise to His servant who believed. How much greater is that promise to His Son who obeyed unto death, even death on a cross? Sovereign grace will see to it that the Son has His reward. Sovereign grace will see to it. The Father didn't fling the Son out there into this world with the possibility that no one would believe. I can assure you, He saw to it that they would believe. That there would be a people. A people elect from the very foundation of the world. Explain that truth, you lose your mind. Throw it away, you lose your soul. It's true. Now, I think we'll maybe call it a day here. And we will look when we get back at Isaiah 53.11. Next week I should be here. Please pray for me. I leave on Thursday to go preach up in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, dear brother Kurt Daniels. I guess I have to call him Dr. Kurt Daniels now. Uh, Dr. Kurt Daniels. And i um, looking forward to it. Um, but um, a lot... This next two months is going to be really kind of kind of difficult so just pray for me please and um, guys please understand something all of you in this room must I want you faced with the reality that the Christian life is absolutely wonderful I want you to be faced with the reality you're debtors you debtors to all men. And I do want you, with all my heart, 
to lay aside things that don't matter. Lay aside childish things. Serve the Lord with whatever He's put in your hand. Serve Him. Serve Him. And rejoice in being able to be tired for Him. Let me ask you a question. Do you end your days, most of your days, except maybe when you take your Sabbath break, do you end your days tired? Then I feel sorry for you. You need to end your days, each day, needing sleep and needing rest because you have worked yourself so hard for the glory of God. And I say for the glory of God because I I realize that many of you work in different jobs not directly associated with what would be considered ministry. But whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, you do it under the glory of God. You do it not as eye service to men, but to please God. I mean, I just, I just, I guess it's my generation or the way I was raised. I can't think. I mean, the only reason you go to bed is because you're tired. And you're tired because you've, you've, you've worked. You've worked. You've ministered. You've done your duty. It's a good thing. It's a pleasing thing to lay your head on that pillow. Knowing that that day you spent it. You spent not only the day, but you spent yourself for His honor, His glory. So, don't think of just worship for the glory of God. Think of being tired for the glory of God. Now, for those of you who are husbands and fathers, now for you young guys, you need to, you just need to knock yourself out. Just get off work, start preaching, do something. Just study, preach. Knock yourself out. For those of you who are husbands and fathers, you get home and and, and it's another type of ministry that also ought to... It, it'll take from you. I'm not saying being tired for the sake of being tired. When I'm saying work, I'm not saying work all the time and neglect your family. What I'm saying is give yourself... Give yourself to your wife. Give yourself to your children. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. All right, let's pray. Father, thank You for this day. Thank You for Your kindness. And please help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen.